another episode of Dialogues with me, Richard Reeves. My guest today is Nick Gillespie, who is the editor at large for Reason Magazine and one of the most prominent and provocative and accessible libertarian writers uh, who I think is working at today. And he has a new essay out uh, in Reason Magazine, uh, which is on cancel culture, uh, that overused phrase, but he breaks it down usefully into the different levels at which free speech might be being stifled at the individual level, at the institutional level, and then finally at the legal or political level. I, I don't think things are as bad as Nick portrays, especially at the at the legal level at this point. And I'm more concerned, I think, than he is about uh, self-censorship and the extent to which this is a cultural issue in the way that we are more, more careful perhaps in disagreeing with each other than, than we would have been before and how that's bad for a liberal culture sort of broadly defined but along the way we also talk about the shift to online journalism which we've both had some experience of we get a sense of his particular problem with facebook everyone has their own problem with facebook right now he has his own and, and his views about culture generally as being superior and they're more decentralized so it was a pretty broad-ranging conversation as these ones often are but uh, also this one was a lot of fun so i hope you enjoy it too so nick gillespie welcome to Dialogues, my podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a so, real pleasure. My son's going to be thrilled. One of my sons is a big, a big, big fan of yours. So he's going to be like, finally, on the twenty first podcast, I'd get somebody who I might, I might listen to. And uh, I must admit, I've, I've read a lot of your stuff, Nick, and um, listened to it, to your podcast, which is the Reason Podcast, which is excellent. So thrilled you could join um, mm -hmm. me today. So I want to dig into some of your thinking about the essay that you've just written on the cancel on cancel culture this much overused phrase that you mm -hmm. you break up but for those who don't who don't know you who are you um, <laughs> where do you come you know from? i and who's, with who's, every and, passing day i i could I, you know i consider myself a postmodernist as well as a libertarian and with every day that that gets harder and harder to answer that question who am i or uh, what am I? What was what a, I? Where did but, you come from? Uh, so I grew up lower middle class in Middletown, New Jersey, which is about 50 miles outside of New York, which is where I'm talking to you from. It's been a long circuit back to my hometown, I guess, or my birthplace. And um, I uh, went to Rutgers University. I was an English and psychology double major. I was the first generation of my family to go to college, which has left an imprint on me. Uh, that I realize, uh, and again, for somebody who's a professional libertarian, I share with Marxists an abiding interest in class and how that actually oftentimes invisibly structures almost every interaction across every possible dimension. Uh, but I majored in English and psychology, and then I um, started writing professionally when I was in college, actually. Um, but then I became a journalist after, and I did a stint in Manhattan in the um, mid to late 80s, writing for music magazines and teen magazines. I, I just, I love entertainment. I love popular culture um, as well as high culture. And I, I, you know, generally don't see much of a distinction that's worth drawing between them. It's all culture. It's all participatory in its ways that individuals and groups and people both express themselves and uh, you know find meaning in the world find their place in the world and communicate and have a dialogue and a conversation when i joined reason in 1993 i was finishing my phd um, one of the reasons i was brought on is reason is a you know a mo was mostly a public policy magazine a politics magazine more than a culture magazine and one of the reasons i was hired was to help flesh out kind of cultural dimensions and in the 90s a lot of what i wrote about in very exuberant utopian ter uh, terms and tones was the deregulation of, of the culture industry by things like the internet by amazingly cheap technology you know five dollar cd players uh vcrs becoming cheap enough where people started using them to dub their own versions of things um and suddenly you got this incredible you know uh flowering of of culture of people being able to express themselves however they wanted whenever they wanted and also being able to consume culture more and more on their own terms so they're sort um, of breaking up the commanding 
commanding heights of the culture. Yeah, right? uh, you guess, know, it's the, yeah. absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, and, and since then, I, I look at a lot of what's going on now. And, you know, this, we'll, we'll talk about cancel culture more. That's actually part of this process. In a way, it's, uh, you know, it's not bad, um, as long as the context is, you know, what this, this thing we call culture, this, you know, whether we're, we're rooting it in, uh, in cyberspace at Facebook or YouTube, or we're talking about on cable or whatever, um, you know, as long as we recognize the best cultures are ones where more people are participating, not fewer, um, and where power and kind of authority is spread around rather than centralized or localized, we're in good shape. The move from sort of analog to digital journalism is something that I, I lived through. Was actually, I, I got out of journalism just in time. Uh, you know, before before this happened, and I yet here you are podcasting. You know, it's you're like uh, Michael Corleone. You know, every time you think you're out, they pull you back in. I guess, yeah, I do remember though. I wrote for the Guardian yeah. and then for the Observer, and the Guardian was sort of heavily, completely unionized, as you as you can imagine. But I do remember this woman who went on to be our head of digital and so on, wandering around the newsrooms with this kind of hang dog look on her face. And she'd come up to us journalists and we all just, we'd write our 800 words of copy or 1200 words of copy and it would go in the paper and then we'd go to the pub and that was it and do the same every day. And she'd go around and she'd say, would you consider writing for the online section? Right. <laughs> but she never had any money. And and, and, and we always said, uh, no. And, and then I got out just in time before, before. It's it's amazing when you think of, you know, in a publication like The Guardian, which has got to be one of the longest continuously published newspapers uh, in the world, certainly in the English language. It now, without the Internet, it would be, not, I wouldn't say nothing, but it would be such a shadow of what it is because through the Internet and through the web, it's able to just reach so many more people and engage so many more uh, kind of uh, types of people, readers, and have influence. Um, I had a similar experience when I became editor in chief of Reason in 2000. I started as an assistant editor in '93, and then uh, you know climbed the masthead uh, and buried the bodies until 2000 when I became editor in chief. And you know, I, one of my first things we had had a website since 1994, but I was like, "Come on, let's really go big online. This is the future. We're libertarians. We believe in you know creative destruction, innovation, and change." And, you know, when I went to my staff who were not unionized and, you know, everybody, including me to this day, at reason is an at will employee. But, uh, you, you know, I was like, hey, let's write online, um, you know, and everybody was like, no, why? And, mm -hmm. you know, and then eventually, you know, you kind of cudgel them into doing it because it's where the readers are as much as anything else. Um, but. Um, and that was one of the things that shifted is like, you know, when you wrote something and you would you could see that people read it and reacted to it almost instantaneously and that you know there, there are good things and bad things about that but it was quite a shift and um it's it's kind of amazing to think about um like that you know the broad changes in how we um both communicate but also what we take seriously over the past 30 or 50 years it's amazing and again i think a lot of people and i think this is playing out in discussions over uh places like facebook and youtube one of the great you know it's the greatest thing in the world that where there were three you know broadcast stations and dead wood you know just human mannequins uh ventriloquist dummies like walter cronkite were once the voice of authority and reason and they you know they told you what the news was the fact that those people are gone and never coming back is a, is a huge triumph i think for kind of human freedom and human flourishing i don't think we're quite comfortable with that new model and it can at times you know the you know the uh, illusion or the metaphor to reach for is the tower of babel or some kind of mm -hmm. cacophony i don't think it's as bad as that but Man, you know, when we start arguing about whether or not Donald Trump should be let back on Facebook or whether or not Dave Chappelle should be canceled, we forget this massive victory, which is the banishing of, you know, three or four or five or 10 sources of authority that really control the conversation. And we just don't have that anymore. And I think that's great. Sure. Let me try a counter argument, though, which is the idea. Well, I'll make two arguments. One is yeah. the idea of curated spaces so that there right. is there something about the fact that there are only so many column inches yeah. you know, on the op-ed page uh, i mean it's just a story we're going to talk about in a moment is like the cover story for a reason and reason still right. publishes and so actually that 
there are this is back to your earlier point about there being kind of arbiters of value arbiters of cultural you know, of taste and so on so curators effectively this is what matters this is what's authoritative right. this is the information that you should be receiving and mm -hmm. you saw in the uk for example when covid hit people st went back to the bbc because they just thought well most of what i get from the bbc is going to be mostly factually accurate right so yeah there is this kind of right so whatever you i i wonder so is there anything to the idea that having any kind of curation is useful for people? And secondly, well, is it yeah. just a lag, right? So I noticed that my mm -hmm. kids are just much better than I am at uh, understanding quality in the internet, right? right? They, 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 they really do know, well, that's bad. This is good. That's from, so that they can, they can consume digital media with a quality control in their head that right. I just don't have. But there's a whole generation, I think, who just basically have the internet without the internal quality control. Is that? I fair? Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, one of the things I would say is that, there, of course, there is curation. And people like, uh, you know, my predecessor, Ed Reason, the woman who hired me, Virginia Postrel, talked in the 90s about how the internet was, you know, the internet age was the age of the editor. It really is all about curation because suddenly you have, you know, a massive, you can rummage through everything, including, you know, virtually everything that's been written is somewhere online in the past, uh, you know, TV shows, uh, radio shows, they don't disappear, they're just out there and you have to rummage through this enormous bin to find them. And that's where curation and, you know, editing comes into play. Um, if not at the sentence level, then at the level of saying, hey, here is something interesting to look for. Here is something good. This is why I like this. And I think it's not surprising that uh, places like the Drudge Report, uh, Instapundent, which right after 9-11 was a huge uh, kind of site, but Real Clear Politics, Arts and Letters Daily, that many of the fixtures of our current age are curation sites where there are people who say, this is a filter. We're going to put on all of this material. And if you like what you're seeing, come back mm. again and we'll give you more. Um, I think there's also a notion of kind of to talk about brand, not as, um, you know, something that you, uh, you monetize, but, um, certain people develop brands, whether it's an individual brand or, or a kind of corporate or outlet brand where it's like, well, you know what? Like, you know, reason is going to, you know, I hope anyway that reason is, you know, it's reliably libertarian, but it's also, it does good work and it shows, it shows why it comes to certain conclusions and you build up a credibility, uh, and a reputation that helps. What's good, uh, you know, and obviously that has always existed, um, you know, in in print or in media, but it's easier now to kind of break into that if you come through with something. Th uh, you know, you talk about The Guardian, that puts me in the mind of somebody like Glenn Greenwald, who obviously has a weird and checkered history and, you know, who knows where he's going to be in five minutes from now, but he started as a blogger. Uh, you right. know, who just was writing out into the ether, got picked up by Salon, which, you know, at the time was a big publication in the 90s and uh, late 90s and early 2000s. One of the early, like Suck and Slate, it was one of the early big websites, really. Um, you know, he goes from there, then he ends up at The Guardian, you know, where he does like fantastic work uh, and has wrote a couple books that did well. And then he creates The Intercept. And then he's like, you know what? The, the Intercept is corporate media. I mean, that's how he he denounces it. And he says, you know, they're terrible. And now he's on Substack. And what stays with that is, you know, many of the places he worked have really good reputations or had them. He has a, a particular reputation. And that's, you know, it's really kind of a reputational economy as much as anything else. And what I like about it is that somebody like Glenn Greenwald or, you know, the, the guys who are at hot air, there's a guy, you know, which is a right leaning blog that was started by Michelle Malkin, who's insane, right? A right wing, uh, you know, uh, propagandist whose first story, by the way, in a national magazine was in Reason years ago about how uh, Seattle police were using drug laws to kick to kick out old black women from their houses. Um, you cannot imagine that's like a different planet. That's a different mm -hmm. timeline, M Michelle Malkin, yeah. right? Um, but hot air. The guy who's the main guy there is this guy, Ed Morrissey, who was working uh, in a Target call center in Minneapolis. And then he started a blog and then it became big and bigger. And, you know, and, and you know, that's just kind of great. And that yeah, goes that's five. a kind of meritocracy in a particular sense of it like that. Yeah. I actually think my, we probably know Scott Winship, who's a friend of yeah. mine, is AI. Yeah. And, and actually, I think he got hired 
um, to his first think tank job because he had a little blog that That's was right. starting to get noticed by various people uh, and so on. And you, you do and see that, that happening. So That can be like, you know, it can lead to a proliferation of cranks um, or not. And this is where, I, I, again, I said I'm a postmodernist in that sense that I uh, indulge in what uh, Jean-Francois Leotard, Jean Leotard called um, incredulity toward meta narratives. I'm skeptical of sources of power and things like that. So it's good. You know, but you, you got to check it out. And that goes to your second yes. point, which I, I have two sons who are 27 and 20, um, and they are digitally native and they have a, I think, a better bullshit detector when it comes to certain forms of media that they grew up with. Not always, but, but um, that is absolutely essential. And to me, it's, you know, this is where when people want to regulate cyberspace or the Internet or whatever you want to call it. They always get it wrong where they're like, we're going to go through this infinite catalog of things and we're going to we're going to block the things that are bad. Like you're never going to get anywhere doing that. What I think you have to do is teach people how to consume information, how to read, how to synthesize, how to be critical consumers of information. Um, and that actually, you know, going back to the 90s, one of the things I wrote about a lot in the 90s for reason was cable TV for the first time really went on mass in the 90s. It was te technologically feasible in the late 60s and early 70s, but uh, various political groups like the National Association of Broadcasters kept it from being rolled out. By the 90s, it was everywhere, which led to terrible things like Bruce Springsteen's song about how there's 57 channels on, but, you know, it's 57 channels, mm, but nothing's nothing on. on. Really dumb. Uh, but what I uh, looked at were shows like Beavis and Butthead, Mystery Science Theater 3000, The Simpsons, uh, actually were teaching us how to consume TV with a critical lens. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting that you get, you know, every media, every medium uh, kind of starts to develop its own mores and it, it starts to teach its users, okay, this is how you use this well, this is how you use this critically. And I think there's a lot of that online. Um, and part of the problem is that when you see the people who are always trying to regulate Facebook and you know YouTube, and it's Elizabeth Warren, it's Ted Cruz, it's Josh Hawley, it's like people who don't get it, who don't use it, um, and they're very similar in that way to the old, you know, the old bags who were trying to control comic books or rock music in the 50s. It's an it's a generation that is removed from what they're trying to regulate. They don't understand it. And so, of course, right. they try to, to crush it and regulate it. So so it makes them feel good. I think that's right. There's this a lag effect. I mean, I think the question is how mm -hmm. how long the lag is and what damage can be done. But I certainly yeah. you, know, you do see it. I see it among my in-laws and so on. Just very low very low skill level in terms of quality control right um, i mean that is, and high expo and high exposure and then you know the yeah. other end i've got my kids who are like high exposure but pretty high skill level and then there's whatever the matrix is and so i do think there's this this we've had this period where this the pace of the expansion of these right. outlets and the places you can go has been very extraordinarily rapid. I had Nick Clegg on earlier and he's kind of like, and he loves to point out that Facebook's, you know, a teenager still. And, um, yeah. and I think it takes a lot longer to develop the skills to, I do, to think do that self curation. And in I, the meantime, we're in, yeah. we're, we're in, tr I think that's good. Honestly, that's a source of a lot of the problems you talk about in your essay. I think that there's also, you know, not to, uh, let the younger generation, which I'll, you know, generously define as, you know, anybody under 40 or something, you know, but, um, wow, that is generous. Yeah. You know, well, I, I mean, I, <laughs> as you, you know, get older, yeah. What, yeah. One of the, you know, it's, it's a mixed thing. I, I used to be a columnist at the daily beast and, um, I wrote in 2016, I wrote about how, okay, forget their politics, but it's kind of great that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, who were like 155 years between them, you know, were actually kind of vital and nobody was like, oh, you know, they're really old. I mean, with Joe Biden, I think, you know, you cross a kind of Rubicon to a, a nursing home. But, you know, it's it's amazing. This is one of the other great kind of generally unremarked upon um, transformations of the past half century, which is that, you know, my, my parents were born in the 20s. They were old when they had me. But, you know, when they hit 50, they were worn out. They, that mm -hmm. it was over. And like, I know a lot of people who are barely, you know, getting started uh, in their 50s. So that's pretty amazing. But um, not to let the younger generation off the hook completely. There is, I think, broadly observed a, um, I guess Tom Nichols has called it the death of expertise. But there is oftentimes a contempt for 
any kind of depth um, and any kind of long, deep understanding of a topic or a subject. And so I find, um, you know, I find that troubling. And I don't think it's only for it's only younger people, but within a kind of online uh, kind of ecosystem, people very quickly lose any sense of history, any sense of progression or, you know, trends and things like that. So everything, you know, that we we live in an epidemic. The pandemic is not COVID for me. It's presentism that the only thing that has existed is what's immediately before us. And it's going to be like this forever. And that deeply worries me because I think the way that capitalism works best is actually with a deep sense of history. Um, I realize there's a long and profound Marxist critique of capitalism, which is that what capitalism does is it erases the past so that nobody understands the power relations, you know, that, mm. that gave, give rise to the present moment. I actually think capitalism works much better when people understand the past because, you know, that one of the great things that capitalism has done is it's delivered the world, uh, you know, increase and in increasing numbers, certainly Western Europe and North America in, in the past hundred years, it delivered the world from privation to surplus to a post scarcity economy. And we're forgetting that. And I think we are taking for granted the idea that wealth production just happens anyway, and is easy to do. And we can just kind of promiscuously redistribute everything because we'll always make more. And in fact, so, that's not really true. That's so interesting. I actually wrote a little an essay for the Guardian mm -hmm. enough, about capitalism. And one of the, the things I was thinking about was the extent to which capitalism is future oriented. It, 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 it orients us to the future. By, by definition, for markets right. to work well, we have to be thinking about the future. It has to right. be a return on investment. It has to be worth taking that risk, yeah. et cetera, and reliably deliver some kind of return. And I think the that break with previous history where you would think about the gods or the past, you'd think about your ancestors and so on. So I think capitalism's innately future oriented, right. intrinsically so, but I think what you're saying is that the danger with that is that it forgets its own history. Yeah. And so well, and cap capitalism it. forgets yeah. the success of its, of its own success. It's by definition yeah. not backward looking. But you're now saying well, the trouble is because capitalism doesn't encourage us to be backward looking. It's always about the future. It means that we don't see how far it's brought us. I I agree. And I love your uh, idea about the future um, because I think that is true. And, um, you know, and that's good. Um, and part of for me what i and again this is kind of a broader thing that i a development or trend that i think is particularly um uh strong among younger people is that they don't uh you know i mean I, it might be too much of a cliche to say that for most of them if you're under 40 you grow up after history you grew up af after the collapse of the soviet union and for all the talk of you know the end of history being wrong blah 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 the fact of the matter is is that liberal democracy and markets still dominate the world and china you know china became an economic power not by being more communistic but by becoming more capitalist and so in a broad sense you know there are not these two large systems that are dueling for for world domination and the attempt by neocons whether they were liberal or conservative to uh assert that islamic terrorism was going to replace the soviet union or international communism as a threat to liberal democracy you know that's uh, that was that we knew that was false on september 12th but it's you know it certainly is false uh now but the result is that um you know we just i you know uh, uh, people don't know where they came from or where they come from. And I find it amazing when I think about this, you know, as somebody who's a first generation to go to college and you know, my grandparents were all immigrants from Ireland and Italy. Um, I was reminded on a daily basis, partly just in my grandparents' bodies, because they were, you know, they were all like the Italians were all under five feet tall. All of their kids were, you know, five and a half feet tall. All of their grandkids are six feet tall because of a difference of, you know, the kind of terror in which you grew up. And we now, we don't think about those things. And even, you know, even minorities and even marginal communities tend to like not really think about the past. Um, it, you know, all they think about is the present and it, you know, it, it complicates things. And I think it makes it hard to have good policy. I think it, it makes it really hard to have good conversations about what policies are best. And also to then to to think clearly about the future. 
I'm, I'm thinking about this. I think I quoted this in the Guardian piece, but from Adam Thurwell's novel where someone talks about late capitalism and one of the other characters responds late we're barely getting started yeah and it actually it's interesting i mean you've mentioned leotard and skepticism yeah. about you know you know meta narratives and so you know i'm sure you'd be comfortable talking about late capitalism for you know the the, the rest of the day but that's uh, that, that was, was, it was a long time ago wasn't yeah. it late capitalism I mean, can i uh, <laughs> just something that was very funny so i was in grad school mostly like from 88 to 93 so among other things i saw that i was in grad school for literary and cultural studies you know, very kind of uh, Marx, not Marxist, but left wing orientation. There were there there should be more Marxists in universities. I think that would actually make them better. It's Marxists aren't the problem. It's kind of dull left wingers who don't really have a clear ideology other than envy and kind of hatred of the present and of the masses. But um, uh, so you know, when the Berlin Wall fell. Um, I was like, you know, this is amazing, isn't it? I was talking to my students and they were like, no, it doesn't really matter. You know, East Germany is nothing. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, I was like, this is a world historical moment. Like, you know, more than anything, forget, the, I don't know, like the Kennedy assassination or the moon landing, this is it. And everybody was like, no, but people I noticed, they went from talking about late capitalism uh, right up until December, 1991. And then they started talking about advanced capitalism. Uh, without acknowledging the ling linguistic shift. And now they're back to late capitalism because- Oh, it's uh, back, and, I didn't, know, and I didn't know it come back. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, when you, if you read a lot of even increasingly kind of mainstream publications that have progressive, like progressives are always talking about late capitalism. And there's, you know, there's an Instagram hashtag, a standing hashtag that's late capitalism, so. Okay, but it had to be, had to be put into onto the bench for a while yes. before being brought back because well, the 90s were because, the 90s was great 90s. for capitalism i think and for the world in terms of globalization and trade and i think you know in the end uh, you know this is something i just recently interviewed stephen pinker for my podcast and he obviously gets a lot of uh, you know slings and arrows his way for arguing that there is such a thing as progress and like the last 200 years kind of define that and, you know, that's still happening. I, and I think, you know, it's phenomenal, the material progress that we've made even since the, you know, in the 21st century, which has in many ways been a bust. I mean, you know, it's, it, we've had major catastrophes, including COVID and the financial crisis. And yet people are still moving out of extreme poverty. People are moving into a global middle class and, and even poor people are, you know, they just have more stuff than they used to. And that, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, it's, it, it. The challenge for us, I think, is to say things could be better, even though they're yeah. still significantly more awesome than they used to be. Yeah. And somehow yeah. we find it psychologically difficult to sit in a space where we acknowledge progress and then carry on with the work that needs to yeah. be done. So let's talk about cancel culture because that's um, sure. your cover story. Yes. Let me quote a bit. You say uh, on this idea of cancel culture, you say cancel culture operates. Uh, well, I should first of all say that we could be a very short conversation because it's libertarian in favor of free speech. Right. Shock. Um, but cancel culture operates on at least three different levels, the personal, the corporate, and the political. Each is more troubling than the next because each casts a broader net and eliminates more and more options. Well, I agree with the, basically agree with your topology. Think about the individual, then think about the institution or the company, and then think about what's happening politically. I'm not sure that they get more troubling uh, than mm -hmm. than the next. I'm not sure that they that, that I would put them in that order in terms of ascending kind of problems. But but it's interesting because culture is clearly central to your work. Right. You've explained a bit about you know why um, kind of going forward. And so I do think uh, I do think get, getting the at how far this is a cultural problem as opposed to a legal problem or an institutional problem, right. problem kind of important. So what I'm going to do is reverse the order, if that's okay, and then okay. we can argue about that, yep. which is more important. So let's start at the top with what you call political, where it's political censorship, et cetera. Right. You, part, you point out that Kentucky passed a bill making it a crime to insult police officers. Right. You have a go Not at DeSantis, I, I want et cetera. To, yeah, if I may, just the, the um, you know, they, they push that law on the anniversary of Breonna Taylor's murder by police so it's like wow right. good timing guys but but it yeah pass, though or did it pass? no no it did not no. eventually it's right. kind of hung up and things but yeah laws regulating the business models essentially of facebook and uh you know and other social media platforms did pass in texas and in florida they're kind of currently under um court stays 
while some of the legal issues get worked out. Um, but that, those are examples of, you know, actual government censorship, not at the federal level, but people like Elizabeth Warren and Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley have introduced legislation to either break up or, uh, or limit the ability of these platforms to do business the way they want. Um, a strict libertarian reading of all of this stuff, as you kind of were alluding to, would just be a doctrinaire, a dogmatic one would be like, nothing about cancel culture matters except for government intervention into the ability of people uh, to say what they do or not be compelled to speak certain ways. Um, but we're seeing that. And somewhere in that there's- Well, hold on. Yeah. Kind of like, well, the question that, I guess that's part okay. of my challenge is, are we seeing that? I, I think we're seeing attempts to do that Okay. But I I think what's happening is that the judiciary is basically holding uh, right. so far, and actually I had David French talking about this, but let's take, yeah. now DeSantis is a great example and you talk about him. Right. So DeSantis says, I'm going to fine Facebook or fine social media companies who deplatform, et cetera, and they're going to get fined a million dollars a day or whatever. And it got knocked down by the first serious judge well, that it got to well, as, it, as it, DeSantis it, must have known that it would have done. And so it's, okay. and the same, like yeah. you're right, that Ruby and Hawley write a letter mm -hmm. to Amazon and so forth. So I guess I'm going to make another distinction, which is right. above the level of politics is law. Right. And it seems to me that politics is more of a sandbox where these politicians are throwing these things around, probably knowing privately that it's not going to make it past the judiciary and counting on the judiciary in some ways for right. it not to pass, uh, but the judiciary is holding. So legally, has there been any increase in government censorship attempts or gestures but isn't that just part of the politics of uh, that you know that's fascinating and uh, it is a wonderfully uh, cynical and i think accurate view in many cases that you know probably um, you know for instance uh, up until recently but maybe this is an analogy um, you know, up until recently, there's a bunch of Republican conservatives who every year will uh, introduce a life begins at the moment of conception, whatever that means, Bill, to ban all abortions at the federal level. They know it's not going to go anywhere. It doesn't even get out of their pockets, much less committee or anything like that. But, you know, now we see over time in places like Texas, and this is obviously being subjected to, you know, legal uh, scrutiny, more and more attempts to kind of knock down abortion rights as they were understood six months ago. So I think it matters. I, even if it's just cynical on the part of legislators, um, it is, uh, it's important that they're doing it because it changes the way the judiciary functions. And again, let's, I, I think it's being a little glib to say, well, you know what, they passed these laws in Florida and Texas, but good judges are going to strike these down because that's not always going to be the case or what a judge, what defines a good judge that changes with the news headlines. And recently, and I think this is in the story somewhere, uh, somebody like Clarence Thomas, who used to be a very robust, you know, uh, a fan and defender of free speech, actually outlined in a in a in a, a kind of a moot court point, but in an actual Supreme Court, you know, document saying, hey, you know what, if you want to uh, regulate Facebook, you should start thinking, you should advance arguments that it's effectively a common carrier and that it's like the old yeah. phone company, et cetera. And so you see that. And this is why the cultural argument, I, I agree with you that, you know, at this point, it has proven extremely difficult for governments in the, in the United States, at least at any level to really put the screws to free speech. But the fact that it is keeps going that way, the judiciary will catch up to that. Um, if that becomes a widespread public opinion, um, I, I years ago, I interviewed a left wing um, lawyer, Mark Tushnet, uh, you know, and uh, he I was talking to him about like, what is the effect of the Supreme Court? Because people are always like, well, the Supreme Court will act as a bulwark or not. And he said, you know, realistically, the Supreme Court, sometimes it's a little bit ahead of where the country is. Sometimes it's a little bit behind, but basically it validates a consensus. It, it validates a cultural consensus. So that's why you had Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, um, even though it was, it had nothing to do with the Constitution. And that's why you had Brown versus Board of Education in 54. You know, they're, they're certifying social changes. They're not creating them. So I worry the more you get all of these pissant politicians from the right and the left saying, you know what, I don't like your business model. I don't like the way you, the speech you allow or the speech you disallow. So I'm going to write a law. 
that gets struck down, or I'm going to write a law that doesn't doesn't get out of uh, you know out of the lower house, but uh, you know in, in my state legislature, because eventually you know it wears people down or it becomes yeah. the new normal, and the judges will roll with that. That's well, well, they might. I think that's the fear, isn't it? And so, but I think uh, there's a couple of important distinctions here. I think one is the politics and and the law. And I would say the growing distance between those two. So you just right. use the term le legislators, unironically, right? Um, as if say that is actually what they're doing. Right. Uh, and there'll be a lot of people like Yuval, Yuval Levin, mm -hmm. um, who says the main reason someone tries to become a Republican member of Congress is so that they can get a gig on Fox News afterwards. Yeah. And he said, I I'm not, I'm not joking about that. Right. right. Is what he said, I'm not, that's not a joke. That's actually kind of true. And so if it's, so he says that, um, that's these institutions have become platforms, right? They're not formative, they're performative and they're platforms. And so, so you see DeSantis, you saw Elizabeth, well, you quote all this in your piece, Elizabeth Warren saying to Twitter, you know, I'll break you up so you can't be mean to me and the, the letters and DeSantis and right. so on. So I agree that if they're cynically just doing this, and by the way, I think it's happening on both sides. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, Joe Biden knew that the attempt to continue the eviction moratorium mm -hmm. uh, was going to get knocked down. Right? right. I mean, any, so these people have legal advisors and right. they must be saying to them, yeah, it's not going to make it. And they proceed anyway. Um, and so you think they proceed anyway, knowing that it's almost certainly going to get knocked down as a signal, as a, right. as a gesture, but it continues to put pressure on the judiciary and a, the judiciary might move, but the other thing that might happen is, there's even greater pressure to politicize the judiciary. And mm -hmm. you see it now with, with Republicans being upset about the Supreme Court yeah. justices who, who are just spectacularly good by any standard of judicial competence, right. whatever, whether you agree with yeah, them or yeah. not, right? They're and they are judges. generally, I mean, it's, you know, it's a conservative court too. So it's like, yeah. what the hell are they upset about? Um, but the Federalist Society now is toxic. According to people who know, like, like yeah, and they're, they're arguing, they're saying we need, we need, better judges. But this question, you raised the Thomas point because mm -hmm. are they carriers now or not? And I think this one thing I just want to get your reaction to is there's, a, I think, a presumption in, in what you've said and what you've written that one of the motivations, that the main motivation maybe for breaking up these tech companies is around speech issues and control of information. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, including Lena Khan, who's the 32 year incredibly young head of the federal trade commission right. i only just discovered that's who she was and people like tim Wu's in the white house they would make an economic case and whether yeah. you agree with that or not they would say it's about competition yeah. so they would that, so how do you respond to the people who say look i'm not this is not about speech at all right this is genuinely about the a, an economic power that these people have got and amazon now has amazon basics and whatever right. how you, I think you dismissed that a little bit too too quickly. Um, well, there are a couple of things. One is, you know, the FTC brought it brought a, a case against Facebook, but they were the court immediately threw it out, saying you have not defined. Okay, Facebook is a monopoly. You have not even been a, you haven't defined what it monopolizes, and I think that's meaningful. And that's an economic argument. You know, it's not anything. And and there's always this. Uh, people like the Tim Wu of the world or, the, you know, the hipster, hipster antitrust people, mm -hmm. the neo Brandeisians basically argue when a company gets too big, regardless, you know, it could be the Vatican yep. or it Big could be bad. GM. It's just yep. bad. And so yep. we need to bad. break it up. And it's one of the reasons it's bad is because it stultifies competition, um, which may or may not be true. I mean, it is it's important that the antitrust legislation in America, if you take the law, the, the way the laws are written seriously, um, you know, it's really consumer harm is the standard, not whether or not, you know, it, it makes it tough to, you know, it makes it tough for Burger King to compete with McDonald's. That's not the problem. The problem is whether or not people can get fatty, greasy food anywhere they want at low, low prices. Um, and I think with something like Facebook, there's, you know, this presumption that Facebook just dominate social media, whatever that means, or, or a Facebook like entity and nobody else can compete with them. Uh, and then they buy Instagram and they buy WhatsApp and then nobody can compete with them. But the fact is, is there's all sorts of different alternatives out there and they're not at scale yet, but they may be. And nobody took Facebook seriously when it was knocking off my, uh, MySpace or Friendster. And I'm not saying that. You know, because there has never been a monopoly that unless, uh, you know, a, a monopoly that lasted unless it had the power of the state behind it. Um, we no, don't have to worry about that. But it's really hard 
I, I don't find it a convincing case to say that because of Facebook, you know, social media is squashed. Uh, and Clarence Thomas was talking about things, you know, he plainly knows nothing about in his in his points about mm. why it's a common carrier. It's not it's not AT&T. You know, it simply isn't. And actually, one of the things that's interesting in these laws or, or these documents that came out recently, you know, the internal documents that, you know, showed that researchers at Facebook and Instagram knew that they were, you know, poisoning the minds of young girls. You know, it's actually much more nuanced than that. But one of the other things that everybody in those documents recognizes is that Facebook is losing its grip. Facebook does not have the market power that it presumes it has um, in the same way that Google, you know, Google got gigantic from being a search engine. And there's a pretty good argument that in terms of search, it has something like a monopoly, but the actual barriers to entry are minimal in that. Um, and there's a lot of good alternatives out there. Um, why people don't use them, you know, that's up to them. But yeah, um, you but know, they could, they could, they yeah. could, is, is, is your old point. But I, I do think you, I think it's useful for us to distinguish between these different concerns, the mm -hmm. epistemic concern, if we can yeah. call it that, and economic, right? Yeah. Keep and, I, and also, I think the, uh, you know, the question about things like online, you know, for me, the, my, my problem with Facebook is that it is a reversion to an early, almost a pre-internet model of what it meant to be online. AOL, uh, you know, which at, at a certain point in time, AOL had something like 70% 70, 70 market share of, of that's how people connected to the internet. Um, whereas AOL now, it's somewhere, you know, it's still in like the top 10 websites floating out there in cyberspace, but it, you know, it's nothing. Um, but they had a walled garden model where they they didn't want people to go to the internet because if they go to the internet, they're not hanging out in AOL spaces where they can sell stuff or, or gain, re, you know, re viewership. So they built a walled model and eventually they had to let people pass through AOL out into the internet. Facebook is a complete, you know, it's a reversion to a walled model, which is not a good, you know, for me, I think that's a horrible place to live. Some you know, some people like that and more power to them. But that's one of the reasons why I don't like Facebook. It's uh, it's it's a dull, boring model. And it's also one of the reasons why in North America, by far its most profitable area, people are starting to leave and see, uh, go elsewhere. Or the only people who are left are old farts, you know, who yeah, are who are it, calling I mean, it's, it up it's on it's their jitterbug out. phone. Yeah. So it's like Back. these 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 are kind of panics and we need to look at you know when when suddenly it becomes oh my god we got to do something and you have a lot of hearings you know you got to watch out and the, and then just the last thing that i'll add to this which i think also speaks to the economic powers it should not be lost on anyone especially from a libertarian or public choice economics model is that facebook facebook is currently running ads saying you know where it features people born in 1996 saying like boy a lot has changed since i was born um, you know what? We haven't updated internet regulations in that time. It's, we, it's, it's amazing. time for a change. And like, you, of course, you, make, you make that point. You make that point very well in the essay. That, of and course I, they're I doing the it Nicola. because they are losing, you know, they have plateaued. So they're doing what the railroad barons did. They're suing for a settlement now, which locks them into place. But de desperate, yeah, arguing for a regulation. In fact, I know, obviously, I've, Nick made this point and uh, they are doing, running these adverts. It really struck me that Facebook is now running adverts calling for itself to be regulated yeah. more on Ez, on Ezra Klein's podcasts. So yeah, it's like, okay, they're, they're trying to go to, they're trying to just like laser target um, progressives. I, if I may, that, so. I like to think of, <laughs> you know, in the Star Wars in the second trilogy or whatever, you know, Jar Jar Binks, the dumbest character in like movie history is a senator and he gets you know, he gets rolled into calling to give the emperor like, you know, you know, uh, superior powers or whatever, emergency powers to become Hitler. And that's what people like Elizabeth Warren and, and Ted Cruz in their way are doing. They are Jar Jar. They are every bit as much a senator as Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars. And they are calling for something they don't understand is going to produce the exact opposite of what they want. So. Yeah, I'm def definitely going to clip that bit. No, I think that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's going. What's well, kind of, that's going straight on the page as we used to to say. Let's move to your second level, right? So we talked about yeah. politics, so you know, and law, right? But tr troubling 
troubling signs, but I would say, you know, not not much movement yet. Deplatforming is the second level. So we're yeah. going down a level now, which is the corporate level, right? right? So you give examples of uh, Amazon, you know, taking books off right. its shelves and I think you do Dr. Seuss. Do you do yeah. Dr. Seuss? Yeah. In well, uh, Dr. Yeah. Seuss is kind of a self-canceling. So that's yeah. really more on the personal level. That's that's right. This is more yeah. about uh, institutions right. who, are, who are sort of doing and, um and, and I just, I wonder again, how much to worry about that. So yeah. there are obviously examples of it. Um, and I think you might make the point that you can you know, read Nazi literature, but not stuff that's skeptical about the trans movement and right. Abigail Schreer's book and, and, and so on. Um, and I guess it's kind of, I, I, I think there are lots of things you can read about and go, that's ridiculous. Like, yeah. why are they doing that? Right. But then I wonder whether it's actually as big a problem because Abigail Schreer's book sold out the moment right. it was deplatformed because of all the attention. Although that it she was got. never deplatformed at Amazon. She was, uh, I no, think she was she could, ABA'd. Yeah. And she couldn't like run ads or buy ads at Amazon or something like that. There was another book called when Harry became Sally was, that, that's the was one you write off. about. That was taken down. Yeah. And, and as I point out, um, you know, it's like the book is available at Barnes and Noble and it's uh, it's available at the publisher's website. You know, so it's like I agree with you on a sense that when people, you know, really get the vapors about this and especially, you know, uh, you know, at Amazon, uh, you know, and, and this might slot back over into the other uh, kind of level of things. But, you know, Amazon is the difference between a pandemic that was bearable and a pandemic that was in, you know, like the a new ring in hell. Um, and I think it bought itself some goodwill because it literally and figuratively delivered the goods, you know, when nobody else was doing it. But it's to me, you know, when Jeff Bezos created Amazon, the goal was to as a demonstration project was basically to sell every book in the world, every book in print. And then you have people. Um, you know, kind of deciding, well, I want to take this book off and this book off. And it's it's totally within their power and their rights. And I get why they do it. I think the Amazon letter back to a bunch of conservative senators explaining why they took when Harry became Sally off their uh, off their rolls, even after it had been up for a couple of years selling it, um, you know, makes sense. They said they don't want to stock books that treat trans uh, uh, trans identity as a function of mental illness. You know, OK, that's their the right to do that. But it is, I do find it a troubling move when people whose whole kind of reason for being is to deliver everything, then start saying, eh, except for this and except for this and except for this. And part of that is it's true. Everybody curates everything uh, on some level, like no prevent. But why is it? But why is that troubling to you? I mean, it sounds a bit like the yeah. carrier thing that you're worried about from yeah. our previous conversation. I, if you're like, why, if I want to buy these books, right. as you say, I can go and get them somewhere else. And actually you draw the analogy. I mean, first of all, you keep calling right. out both sides of their hypo political right. hypocrisy, which I appreciate. But, you know, on the one hand, if I'm a, a baker that has mm -hmm. certain views about marriage, then right, I shouldn't right. be forced to, you know, uh, but equally, yeah. if I'm a left-leaning bookseller right. or provider like of goods like yeah. Amazon, and I don't like stuff that says trans is a mental disease, I'm not going to sell those books, and I'm in perfectly entitled yeah. to do that as a private institution. Uh, leave me alone and go and buy it somewhere else. Yeah. So, for, as, a, as a libertarian, why are you troubled by that? Isn't that uh, well? You great? know, let me. Uh, you know, one of the ways that I talk about um, responding, uh, responding to cancel culture is using Albert Hirschman's um, uh, set of responses to what you know, states and firms and societies in decline, exit voice and loyalty. And I would say, in the Amazon example, you know, again, the book is freely available, so this isn't like a make or break thing. You can find it elsewhere. What I find troubling is in a, a corporate culture that starts to get, um, you know, that that on the one hand is saying, OK, you know, here's what we do. This is our mission. And then this is how we act. Um, and I would say this to me is similar to if I go into. Uh, and so what I'm by kind of voicing my discomfort with some of this, it's, it's an act of voice in the Hirschman uh, kind of typology where if my favorite restaurant stops, you know, making my favorite dish, you know, it's in their right. 
Um, and, you know, if I want to be like a kind of dogmatic libertarian about it, I would just be, well, that's this right. I'll just go somewhere else. But there's also the, the, the act of voice to say, you know what? I'm not going to buy when Harry met Sally or became Sally. I'm actually not going to buy when Harry met Sally either, um, <laughs> but uh, which is sadly freely available on many platforms. Um, but, but um, you know, it's like I want to voice the idea that I think it is probably better on balance as a purveyor of books, as the biggest purveyor of books in the galaxy to have more books rather than fewer. Um, so you're trying to balance the voice. Essentially, what you're doing is you're saying you sort of being conscious about your voice and you have a you have a you know, opportunity to share and say, so there's always voices out there that are pushing one way, I'm going to become. And so that contest of voice is really what's going yeah. on. And it's and also true it with, gives you hope, right? with corporations. Yes. And with corporations, I think, that, you know, not so much with Amazon, say, and Barnes and Noble, but there is the possibility of cartelization, which again, might be legal, but it's also, you know, um, I mean, this happened in various business ventures in America. I mean, to use a dumb example that involves Donald Trump uh, in the 80s when Trump helped create the United States Football League, which was a competitor to the NFL. And the NFL got together with stadiums and kind of denied the USFL the ability to have games there or on favorable terms. And again, that might all be perfectly legal. In that case, the NFL actually lost a, a case, but they they received or they had to pay no damages or a dollar damage. But um, you know, I think it's a better world where like, you know, let's let's have more books circulating in more places and have more discussion about it rather than fewer. And I think with um, something like Amazon, it you know what they as a platform and not just for books, but for other things, because they actually have a long list of things they won't sell. And some of them are very arbitrary. Some of them make sense. A lot of it is that they can't keep up. You know, there's just so much work to do. A friend of mine se sells medical devices and they constantly are bumping his device off because they're saying it's not FDA cleared, but it is blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of bureaucratic, you know, snafu and going on. But I think it's important at the corporate level because that is a place where the cravenness of corporations, you know, to a mob mentality to say, mm. fire this person, get rid of this book, do not speak of this, hire only these ty types of people. It's really rampant. It, you know, corporations uh, appear to be imperious. You know, they're, they're empires that will never fall. And they're the easiest thing in the world to kind of manipulate through um, public, uh, you know, public with campaigns. A, so so for me, I think, yeah, you know, it's like I'm, I'm exercising my voice by saying to Amazon, like, you're in your rights to do that. But I think it's kind of a dumb decision. A more difficult situation, I guess, would be the banning of Donald Trump from Facebook and Twitter. Um, and again, you know, Facebook in particular, I talked to one of the guys who's on their governing board who certified, you know, who who both certified their their kicking Donald Trump off, but then also said, you, you got to do more work to make sure this fits in with your own terms of service, which I thought was a good faith effort to deal with this stuff. It's troubling. I mean, I, I dislike Donald Trump intensely. I did not think he's an existential threat to, you know, mom and America and apple pie. Um, but I don't like him. And, you know, the Internet is a little bit nicer with him off it. But it's deeply troubling when a platform like Twitter, you know, bars stories that are about, you know, Hunter Biden and Joe Biden and a couple of weeks before the election. Right. It's but disturbing again, when using, they, you know, you're using voice, though. Right. Yeah. So you're you're not saying. But, it's, you know, I remember a British uh, politician, Michael Portillo, actually saying to us. I'm sure it was off the record, but it was so long ago that I'm sure it doesn't matter. Like to the Guardian, assembled Guardian journalist, he says, the difference between you and me isn't that I don't think every morning when I hear about someone having made all this money from some yeah. company, that I don't think you lucky thing, that's not fair. I uh, The difference is I don't take that feeling with me into the office and then try and legislate right. to get that person's money. So yeah. I, I don't legislate my envy or my, dis or in this case, discomfort or disapproval uh, of it. And I think that, so I, I agree with a lot of what you've said, but I see more signs of hope maybe than, than you do. I think, first of all, I think the left is doing a better job on this mm. than the right. I think you've got persuasion. You've yep. got a lot of people working on the left that mm. are really, you know, Skip Gates just did a whole thing right. for Penn and the Times on yep. free speech. So, so first of all, I think that that's, it is, I, I think credit to the left. I don't think there's the equivalent yep. um, stuff on, on the right. So I think that's the, 
Uh, there That's might the be. Uh, I don't know uh, the group that uh, Barry Weiss uh, founded and her Substack and things like that. Celebrate, you They're know, trying. a kind of heterodoxy yeah. um, and holding kind of conservatives accountable, but. I, you know, I think yeah. that's right, but not as much. I no. would say there's been a more concerted effort, more willingness. So, but then again, you go to higher education, and this is you know a different kind of example, right? They're not corporations in the same way, but again, it's just because it's happening now. There's this. Did you? I'm sure you saw there was this professor, this geophysicist, who was going to give this prestigious lecture mm -hmm. at MIT. Right. You seen Dorian? Uh, what's his name? Dorian something. I've got it. Oh, Dorian Abbott, and the University of Chicago, where he is, said, well screw MIT, we'll just do it online instead. Right. Opened it up to Zoom and they keep having to expand the numbers, right? Of people that are going to do it. I don't know what it's up to 10,000 10, or something, right? So, so, and they called MIT out for its cowardice right. because he, he wrote uh, basically because he wrote something saying he thinks admissions should be purely based on merit to university, right. should be purely based on merit. So he's against legacy preferences, mm -hmm. athletic preferences, and of course, affirmative action. Right. And so he's in trouble for that. So MIT rescinded the cancellation. So, okay. So you roll your eyes and like, oh, yeah. really, but then something kind of amazing happens, right. which is put it online. And so, and I see a lot of that happening. You see the, the books sell out. There's a react, right. there's a, there, so it's back to this point about we're just all growing up with this. I I like to I, I I would say I generally agree with you. And um, you know my my story was not a um, you know my God the you know the lights are going out all over you know the internet or anything like that. Partly because of that, and um, you know even with the New York Post when uh, Twitter you know uh, nuked the uh, Hunter Biden story. It became, you know, it, it almost certainly had a Streisand effect, you know, where more people sought out that story because it was, um, because it was censored by by Twitter. The the Streisand effect refers to what is that? A moment where Barbara Streisand, uh, the uh, um, coastal. Okay, commission, thank God you're talking about Barbara okay. Streisand. I, th I was afraid you were talking about some even more obscure 18th oh. <laughs> century metaphysicist. So, okay, yes, Barbara so Streisand. Bar Go yeah, ahead. Barbara Streisand. Uh, the uh, it's like the California Coastal Commission. They had um, aerial photographs of all properties that are along the uh, the California coast uh, that were in a public database, and at some point. Uh, Barbara Streisand was upset that people would be able to see in her compound, you know, their legendary compound in Malibu, where there's, you know, probably like human plantations and things like that. Who knows what goes on inside these walls? And so uh, she sued to have her image removed from the public database. And at the time she did that, a couple of dozen people had actually looked at it. And then as a result of the case, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, sought it out. And so the Streisand effect refers to where you create more publicity for something by trying to get out of the public eye, um, you know, through legal means and whatnot. And I think that happened with the Post story about Hunter Biden. And, um, you know, but it's still, I, I still find it troubling. And I find it I, you know, I agree. I mean, I believe that companies should have, the, they do have the right to curate whatever they want and however they want to. But I also think, I know I prefer going into salons and stores where things tend to be a little bit more loose and open rather than harshly constrained. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the argument with, with those, with platforms at the platform or corporate level. It does require the individual's concern, though. This is your next level, mm -hmm. which is the sort of self-cancellation. Yeah. I think that it overlaps quite a bit yeah. because very often it is an individual who has to stand up or decide to speak up. And so yeah. you talk about, you go through some various examples of, of uh, self-canceling. And I, I, actually, I think this is, this is why I said I think the order's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm most worried about that. Yeah, I'm actually most worried about this kind of level of it's partly self self canceling is mm -hmm. you know, one example, and truth is they're usually forced into it. But you know when right. they resign, you mentioned yeah. the Boeing guy who resigned. Right? Yeah, but yeah, and Winston Marshall from Mumford and Sons, the banjoist, who uh, you know after committing the the horrible crime of complimenting Andy No, you know a, a right wing controversial journalist about his book. So, you know, decided to step down and then he eventually, he, he, you know, and leave Twitter. And then he later explained that he left the band, but he was obviously forced into that. But there's something deeply disturbing when you read people uh, talk about how, you know, I mean, it, it is very reminiscent of uh, Chinese Cultural Revolution confessions that are technically, um, you know, voluntary, but are clearly forced and done in a public staged ritual way. 
Um, and I, I find that disturbing because it's, I, th I think we are approaching on some level. And again, you know, this is all against the backdrop of a massive flowering of speech, you know, where a million, a hundred million, a, a billion flowers are blooming, uh, partly because of the internet and the breakdown of these old gatekeeper institutions. But we are witnessing a sense where people don't know how to correct themselves without you know, putting a gun to their head um, or something like that, where, you know, if you if you did something wrong, you can own it and kind of go on. And it doesn't mean you're a horrible human being um, or and oftentimes the you know, the I, I in one of the um, self cancellations I talk about is this guy, Dave Pilkey, who's the um, author of a, a series of very popular kids books, the best known as Captain Underpants. And Basically, because of one or two people who launched a campaign against his publisher on a, a different book he had about cavemen who dunk, do kung fu and solve mysteries or something, uh, the the publisher and Dave Pilkey wrote. You know, they pulled these books from publication and they wrote these just pathetic, uh, you know, pay-ins about how they were sorry that they were perpetuating passive racism and they'll never do it again. And please, you know, forgive us. And it's just kind of like what you know what kind of world are we living in that just seems disturbing i would say and i think that i think yeah you 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 say disturbing troubled and so on i think it's because i think it's because of a cultural concern right so this is where the term cancel culture i think is exactly right and i think it speaks really to the heart of your anxiety and where i think the real problem is is less thus far in rules mm -hmm. or laws even in hr rules really and it's much more in this what well, actually what john stuart mill would call a social tyranny right right the yeah. tyranny of custom and actually there's a i, I this is quote from on liberty that i virtually know by heart but i pulled it up to make sure i get it right um where he says society society he's distinguishing it from from law can and does execute its own mandates it practices a social tyranny more formidable than many kinds of political oppression since though not usually upheld by such extreme penalties mm -hmm. it leaves fewer means of escape penetrating much more deeply into the details of life and enslaving the soul yep. itself so the whole of on liberty is about this social tyranny right. it's about this and i think that's what you're speaking to and i think it's almost the problem is i'm just going to try this idea out on you Sometimes it's less what we do choose to say when we choose to say mm -hmm. it, but what we choose not to say. It's just, I don't even think it's self-censorship sometimes as much as a strategic silence. Yeah. So you react to certain things and not others. You avoid whole areas of scholarship, right? I had Catherine Page Harden mm -hmm. on my podcast, right. recently, who does this work on genetics and inequality, right? But she's like, like there are people who just like literally, like, and and if you ask them their own opinion on it, private, they, they give you a sensible answer, right? They don't publicly come out with anything. They, they mm -hmm. just don't say anything. Right. They don't go there. Yeah. Uh, and you see it on Twitter as well. I notice even my own very small Twitter kind of, I, I when I post something that sort of I know is going to, uh, I post something to say, I've done a lot recently on males not completing college, right? I put right. that out and it goes doing, 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 doing down the echo yeah. chamber of my right wing followers, yeah. right? Right. Z nothing from anybody. It's not. I don't get attacked from people left. Just right. silence. And then the same on the other side, right? I put something out about how great the child tax credit is, and goes right. doing, 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 doing down there. Yeah. Silence. Right. It's what we don't say. It's 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 it, that's that troubles me m almost more than anything else. And, and the question is like, why would I? Like, what's the? You do a cost benefit right. analysis at an individual level, same as the corporate level. The the benefit it's a collective action problem because the benefits of a society where we're all a bit more robust and right. kick ideas around without it being the end of the world are felt collectively but the risk right is felt individually yeah and that, i don't know where to go with that thought. i totally agree with that and again you know it's it's always hard to in in a broad sense say and this is the the cost that is being imposed on society by this you can you can look more at an individual person maybe and they you know, they make a statement, um, you know, that then gets them into hot trouble or some or into big trouble. Um, I, you know, I, with this again, to kind of think about this from a libertarian perspective, um, a lot of libertarians would say, you know what they, you know, that um, 
uh, John Stuart Mill is absolutely right. And that is one one other way in which the private sector, the non-state sector is so much more efficient and effective, you know, than government. Um, but it's terrible. I mean, like that's, I, I, you know, when you were reading the Stuart Mill thing, I was thinking about Foucault um, and, you know, the whole, uh, you know, part of Foucault's thought and particularly in a book like Discipline and Punish, he's talking about how, you know, what the kind of what modern, you know, the modern enlightenment did and the state did is that it made us act, you know, on our best behavior, even when nobody was around to beat us if we, tra you know, transgress the, the king's laws. And that's the secret trick. Um, that, you know, you, you are in a prison of your own mind. The panopticon is your head and you are acting on the way that the state tells you to act. Otherwise, you get in trouble. We've taken that now to a place where many people are not thinking thoughts. Many people are certainly are not expressing thoughts. You mentioned the guy at Boeing who was, you know, uh, 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 was a uh, the head of communications at Boeing. And somebody unearthed an article he had written, I think, 27 years before for a military journal in the late 80s, uh, in a, in an opinion piece saying he didn't think that women should be in combat, which was an overwhelmingly, you know, majority point of view at the time. And he even changed his mind on that a couple of years after that piece, but that was used to kind of squeeze him out of Boeing. There's a good chance there's more to that story, you know, than, than that, but, that's an unbelievable pretext for, you know, somebody to be admonished and kicked, you know, forced out of a job decades later for a position that was completely, um, you know, commonplace. Um, and that those types of examples, that is going to change the way that you start to think about things and the way that you express your thoughts about things. And we should be concerned about that. Again, it's not. You know, I, one of the things I dislike about the right and the left, and there's also a lot of this in libertarian thinking is, you know, millenarian thinking that the world is about to end, uh, you know, that, you know, the planet is going to be baked in what, eight years now, or that, you know, Jesus is going to come, uh, whatever it is. And it's like, it's never that. I mean, you know, the, the sad truth of our lives is that, you know, the, we're going to be around for a hundred years and like the, the, the end never comes, but we can make it better or worse. And I think, the more that we focus on trying to, you know, squeeze out people for, for wrong think um, in a wide variety of perspectives at the personal level, the, the worse off society is. Yeah, I agree with a lot of that. Uh, I, think, I think I agree with all of it. And, uh, and I've written a bit about the virtue of truthfulness, which is a Bernard Williams. Um, yeah. He wrote a very good book, Truth and Truthfulness, yeah. uh, and how actually it's truthfulness. It's that virtue. And and that means not only telling the truth, but telling the whole truth right. and continuing to do so. So it, so it isn't I think it isn't in, a, in, a, in an analogous way, there's also, you know, and Sartre is like a, you know, is in many ways a terrible, uh, you know, philosopher and thinker and whatnot, but his concept of bad faith and good faith arguing. Um, I feel like we are in an era where there are almost only bad faith arguments. Uh, nobody, nobody wants to actually put ideas out there and say, Hey, you know what? This is what I think. Um, you know, let's, I'm putting it out here, uh, you know, on, on the showroom platform and I want you to walk around, kick the tires and tell me what's good about it and what's wrong about it. And like that, in a way, I'm thinking a lot about the enlightenment because I did just talk to Steven Pinker and I kind of obsess over the, uh, you know, both, I think, legitimate critiques of enlightenment and also really bad critiques of enlightenment. But, you know, the the whole point of enlightenment society, which helps us get, you know, a lot of moral and material progress is by people being willing to put their ideas out there and subject them to scrutiny. Um, and if we we become a society where we're afraid to say what we believe, what we think to experiment, you know, we're uh, that's not good. That's not good. That's a, it's a real problem. Yep. And it becomes a problem when our ideas are too closely tied to our identity. Mm -hmm. I think that, of course, there's a relationship between the two. But if if our ideas become constitutive of our identity, therefore you disagreeing right. with my idea is to dis is to attack me. Then you've lost you've lost exactly that ability to revise your ideas, yeah. get stuff wrong, and be proved wrong. And I think you know, uh, in, in another way that's related to this too, it's also why you have to control the ideas in circulation because, like, you if you know, maybe you become the bad books or the bad arguments you consume. So we got to get those out of the way because otherwise you're going to become, you know, a, a passenger, uh, you know, for uh, a, a um, you know a, um, a a disease carrier.
for a bad idea. So we got to get rid of bad ideas. We got to get rid of bad books as if these categories are stable and clear cut. Um, you know, this again is kind of the postmodern in me that we, we move towards truth and progress with lowercase t's and p's. And the only way you do that is through a constant uh, kind of renegotiation of what what is what is the limit of our knowledge and how do we expand that? How do we know what is morally good or bad? Because these things are not, you know, they, they don't come from Zeus or from God or anything like that. They're worked out in concert with everyone around us. And I think it's really important to have more, you know, just kind of you, you said the word robust. I mean, that's the thing, like, you know, where people are a little bit more comfortable mixing it up, not not in bad faith ways, but like, you know, let's kind of let's figure out what we really think and what are what are the good ways to deal with X, Y and Z problem or to to be in the world. Well, Nick, it's been a great conversation. We should probably draw, draw it to a close, although I sense we could we could keep going. One of the questions that I think my kids might ask me one day is, Dad, what did you do in the culture <laughs> wars? And I, and I want to have a better answer than, well, I was a conscientious objector. Right. Um, uh, I don't think my answer, though, is going to be quite as good as your answer yet. I think you've got a great answer yeah. to that well, question. I appreciate your... that. That's very kind. Um, I think it might be misguided. And I now, uh, I'm not sure I trust your judgment on other things, but I appreciate that. Very no, much. well, quite, quite right. But you, you started off by saying you're 58. So, you know, you're, you're, on, you're on the gentle slide into a gilded retirement anyway. Oh, I God. So I, well, you know, not, not, not if late capitalism keeps up. I'm going to be working. Uh, it's a reverse, you know, reversion back to you work until you die. You retire. Retirement is that very, fifteen minute walk from the uh, church to the cemetery, right? Very late capitalism yeah. now, but anyway, thanks right. so much for joining me, Nick. I really enjoyed that. Great. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.